keep your Bibles in front of you. Um, I am going to be um, preaching from those two short verses and some other places around the Bible. You might want to just uh, flick forwards and backwards. Uh, you might want to take notes and look them up later. Uh, but uh, good evening. Uh, it's good to see you. We're continuing our series tonight uh, called The Five Solars. Now, if you're visiting with us or if you are new or if you just missed uh, last Sunday, uh, let me explain to you what we mean by the five solars. The five solars were uh, five uh, key theological Latin phrases that were popular during the Protestant Reformation. Uh, of course, we're doing a Reformation series in the morning and the evening. It's the 500th anniversary of the Reformation coming up. Um, and these, were, these five points were five uh, points of doctrine which were um, points of, of contention uh, between the Protestants and the Roman Catholic Church. Essentially, they are five gospel truths, five essential truths for which men and women were willing to die for and indeed did die for. These five doctrines make up uh, the essence of what we confess as Christians. And so they're really important. They're really important to know and to understand and to believe. The word solar, as we said last week, simply means alone. And so we might call these, instead of the five solars, we'd call them the five alones. Um, last week we looked at uh, sola scriptura, uh, which means scripture alone. And the idea behind that biblical teaching is that uh, the Bible is our final authority in all faith and practice. That every doctrine, every sermon, every church council, every church creed, every tradition must be evaluated by scripture and is subordinate to scripture. Sola scriptura. Well, tonight we're moving on to our second sola, our next sola, sola gratia, which means grace alone. Grace alone. And although it may be a, a man-made phrase, it is not a man-made idea. It's not a man-made teaching. It's a teaching from the Bible. And so you see why it's important that we started last week with sola scriptura. We started with the scripture alone because if we don't uh, affirm, if we don't believe sola scriptura at the beginning, then the danger is that we can add other things. Uh, we can add other things which then undermine sola gratia by grace alone. So what is sola gratia? What is grace alone? What's it about? Well, Sola gratia, grace alone, is concerned with the basis of our salvation, the foundation of our salvation. It's, uh, it's about how we are saved. It's, uh, if we ask the questions, um, how is it we are saved? What is it that saves us? Uh, it's incredibly important we have good answers to those questions for our own sake, but also for those with whom we would seek to reach with the gospel the answer that sola gratia comes up with to the question what is the basis of our salvation is god's salvation comes to us by grace alone and not by any works or merit of our own put another way there is nothing this is good news there is nothing we can do to earn salvation we are not saved because of anything good in us but because of something very good in god i remember i got my first job when i was when i was 14 it was a paper round uh, i'm sure some of you had similar stories of your first paper round or helping out on the milk round whatever it might be and apart from when i was studying for my theology degree I, i've always had a job every single day since then and that first Saturday, after I'd done my, my paper round, and Saturdays were, were, the weekends were always heavier because they had more papers, they had supplements, and you had to take two bags out. And that last day of the first week, when I completed my round, and I went back to the newsagents, I was handed that little brown envelope with all of, I think, nine pounds in it. Man, 
did that feel good? I felt really good. I was getting paid. And I'd earned it. I'd worked hard. It felt good and it feels good to earn, doesn't it? It does. It feels good to earn. It feels good to work hard and have that work rewarded. It feels good to make something of yourself. And throughout my working life, whether it had been a day stacking the shelves at the supermarket or a 13-hour nursing shift or a night shift at the university working security, coming home at the end of the week or at the end of the month, whatever it was, with that pay slip, knowing that I'd worked really hard, knowing that I could now put my feet up, that knowledge that I'd earned for my family, it feels good. It feels good. And do you know what? That is good. That's a good thing to work hard and to earn your way and to earn your keep and to serve. It's a good thing. Until we import it into our theology. Then we have a problem. We like to make our own way, don't we? We like to be self-sufficient. We, we don't like relying on charity. But we can't be self-sufficient when it comes to salvation. And so it's dangerous to think that we can. Sola Gratia tells us, and here's the sermon in, in one line, salvation is a gift to be received. It is not a service to be bought. Salvation is a gift to be received. It's not a service to be bought. Now, naturally, we, we don't like that very much. For a couple of reasons, but but mainly because, like I said, we don't like to be the recipients of charity. And we reject the belief that there is something we can't do for ourselves. I can do it myself. I'm a grown man. We don't like it, do we? We like to think that whatever happens, we can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We can make it work. If If we work hard enough, we can make something of ourselves. But we can't. When it comes to salvation, when it comes to our standing before God. But why? Why, Doug? Well, let's just have a quick look at what the Bible says about our spiritual condition, about why we can't make it work ourselves, why we can't work ourselves. I'm going to go through these pretty quick. I'm not going to wait for you to find them, I'm afraid. But if you want to write them down, look them up later. Job 14, 1 to 4 says, Man who is born of woman, I, and we could put there woman who is born of woman, and, and in that case, and that's everyone in this room. Uh, man who is born of woman is, a, is of a few days and full of trouble. He comes out like a flower and withers. He flees like a shadow and continues not. And do you open your eyes on such a one and bring me into judgment with you? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean thing? There is no one. In other words, what we're seeing here is that we are, well, first of all, our lives are very temporary, they're fleeting, they go by so quickly, but we are born unclean, we are born impure, we are sinful, and therefore we are subject to the judgment of God. And Job asked the question, how can anything good come out of something that is sinful? And the answer is given, it can't. Something sinful cannot produce something good. Jeremiah 13, 23 asks a similar question. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard change his spots? Then also you can do good who are accustomed to evil. We can't do anything against our true nature. The prophet writes, The day that we can change our nature, the day that we are able by ourselves to make ourselves right with God, the day that we are able to do even one righteous act by our own choosing and our own power will be the same day that any one of us are able to change the color of our skin by sheer willpower. It's not going to happen, is it? It's not going to happen. The psalmist writes in Psalm 51, Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time, even before birth, from the time my mother conceived me. It's not something that we like to hear, is it? But we're we're born wicked. We're born evil. We're born not wanting to go God's way, but going our own way. 
We don't need to learn how to sin, do we? It comes quite naturally to us. And I always think that anybody who questions the doctrine of original sin clearly has never had children or spent much time around them. Because I don't have to spend time teaching my children how to be bad. They do that really well themselves. I have to spend time teaching them how to be good. How to be good. We're born with sinful natures, with selfish natures, and the instinct is to reject God and do what serves us. The author of One King says, there is no one who does not sin. Are you getting where I'm going with this? The author of Proverbs laments, who can say, I have made my heart pure, I am clean from sin? And the implicit answer being, no one can say that. Moses wrote in Genesis 6, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Because we are born in sin, because we are born cut off from God, every inclination, even the ones that look or feel good, every inclination is sinful and evil. But we like to think that we're not so bad. Each one of us, we're not so bad. We don't do those big sins. Let's see what Paul says in Galatians. He says, the works of the flesh, meaning those those sinful things that come from the flesh, from the person, are evident. And he lists them. Sexual immorality, impurity, and just listen to this list. Sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, falling out, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We like to think we're not so bad. We don't do any of the big sins. But Paul kicks that right into touch, doesn't he? Here, Paul puts jealousy and hatred in the same category as orgies and witchcraft. Sin is sin, Paul says. I don't don't think there's any one of you here. You might not like to think the idea that you've hated, but you have. And you've certainly been jealous. Sin is sin. All sin cuts us off from God, no matter how small you may think it is. If you have ever hated, if you've ever lied, if you've ever been high or you've ever been drunk, if you've ever committed any kind of sexual immorality, and let's remember how how Jesus defines that in Matthew 5. He says that's even looking lustfully at at a member of the opposite sex. That's even... um, looking, thinking lustfully or having sexual thoughts about anybody that you're not married to. If you've ever been selfish, if you've ever been jealous, if you've done any of those things, you have demonstrated your sinful nature and you have proven yourself to be a sinner, cut off from God. And I would guess that, again, even with that very short list of sins, every single one of us in this room, or every single one of us who are watching or listening to this later, all of us would have to say, yeah, that's me. That's me. I'm a sinner. I have sinned. You see, we have this great notion that we want to earn We want justice. We like the idea of merit and earning. We want to be paid what we deserve. But Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. Do you really want to earn? Do you really want to get what you deserve? See, naturally, we just think, I just want God to be just. I just want him to be fair. I'm not so bad, really. He should let me in. How many times have you talked to a non-Christian whose main objection is looking around the world and says, well, God's not fair? The problem is that we don't understand what true justice would look like if he suddenly acted fair. 
I just want God to be fair. I want him to give me what I've earned. That's the last thing I want. It's the last thing I want, is God to be just towards me. The last thing I want is God to give me what I've earned, because I would be damned. I have hated God. I have gone my own way. I have broken his law. If God were to pay me what I have earned, I'd be gone. Death. That's what I've earned. The wages, the payment of sin is death. I don't want justice for me. I don't want what I've earned. I want something better. Something I don't deserve. It's called grace. Our reading in Ephesians says, For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. It's only by grace that we can be saved. And grace, by its very de definition, is a gift. It's something we're given that we don't deserve. And this grace that we're given in Jesus is completely comprehensive from start to finish. And some of you might struggle with this, but don't dismiss this. Listen to the scripture, Sola Scriptura. It is the scripture that informs us on spiritual matters. The grace that God gives has to be completely comprehensive. Why? Because our depravity and our sinfulness, our sin is completely comprehensive. We are naturally, completely, comprehensively cut off from God. And so we can't even choose. We can't even believe in God until, by His grace, He shows us our need and calls us to Himself. Jesus says in John's Gospel, in chapter 6, verse 44, he says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. No one can come to me until the Father draws him. In other words, you can't even come to God unless you've first been drawn. And, and I love uh, this. The word drawn here is used elsewhere in the New Testament. It means drag. You're dragged to God. It's the way, it, it's not that we by ourselves realize we come to some, you know, epiphany. Oh, I think I might be evil. I think I might be sinful. I think I might be bad. And then by ourselves make our way to God. And we do that bit by ourselves, ask to be saved, and then grace kicks in. No, that would be terrible news. Remember all those verses I've listed about how sinful we are. There's a whole, whole raft more we could go to. Nothing good can come out of that which is corrupt. Do you know what? Turning away from sin is a good thing. Recognizing God as Lord is a good thing. How can we do that by ourselves? We can't. We are so corrupt. We are so depraved. We are so spiritually dead we cannot even understand our need for God until he, by his grace alone, drags us from our love of sin and gives us instead new life, new desires, new affections that seek out the Lord. Sola Gratia says, if God does not do something to rescue us, we will perish in our sins because there's nothing we can do. I've heard Christians affirm that we are saved by grace alone, but then go on to, to say, well, we need to do something first, though. Unless we decide, unless we choose, unless we accept Jesus, grace is useless. Well, that's a denial of Scripture, and it's a denial of sola gratia. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. This is good news. We'll get to that in a minute, but it's good news, I promise you. Read that clearly. We are saved by grace. We're not saved by faith. We're saved through faith. But we're not saved by faith. 
We're not saved by our own faith. We're not saved because we believe well, in other words. If I just believe enough, I'll be saved. Rather, we believe because we are first saved by grace. To think grace depends on faith is to misread and misunderstand what Paul has written here. God makes us alive when we are dead in sin. And this is what it means to be saved by grace alone. And some of you perhaps are going to struggle uh, with sola gratia because our culture and even vast swathes of evangelicalism is very much in love with the idea that every believer can make a new beginning. Every person, by their individual freedom... We're, we're big on freedom these days, aren't we, in our culture? Everyone can do what they want and all this jazz. Every person, by their individual freedom, we believe, is able to make a decision for or against God. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Salvation is a gift to be received. It's not a service to be bought. So la gratia, grace alone saves and that is good news it is the best news you will hear today it's the best news you will hear all week in fact it is the best news you will ever hear in your whole life i promise you it has massive implications for our lives and for our church and so i just want to apply sola gratia into three areas and firstly, I want to, us to consider for each of us what it means for our communion with God, our relationship with God, how we stand before God. The problem is, um, I remember my dad saying, um, you know, if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. He's, he, he's fairly right, apart from on this. He's not right on this. But the problem is, we do, don't we? We read this and we think, wow, that just seems too good to be true. It's the best news in the world, and, and it's so good, in fact, that we are tempted to disbelieve it. And we can, what happens is we can uh, uh, believe and we can affirm sola gratia with our mouths, and we can believe everything I've just said, I believe it, and yet we can still slip back into this works righteousness view of salvation. I do it, you do it, and we will look at how in a minute. We all do it from time to time. We're all tempted to slip into our old way of thinking, into the world's way of thinking. And here's a question which is going to highlight, I think, um, it's a diagnostic question to think about this, times when we do this. Ask yourself this question. Have you ever felt, oh, I, I can't pray right now because I've just sinned? Have you ever felt that? Or is it just me? <laughs> I'm going to lay myself open here, guys, but... You know, if you've ever felt, I can't pray until I've cleaned myself up. I, I can't really worship to, right now because I've just done that bad thing. I can't because I'm, I'm just messed up too bad. I don't know if you've ever had those thoughts. I can't come to God right now because of what I've just done. Because you've, perhaps you've sinned in such a way that you feel you were just too dirty to come to God. I can't pray to God when I've just done that. I can't go to church and worship when I've just had blown up and had an argument with my wife and my children. Anybody ever felt like that? I have. There have been times in my life when I've, I've wanted to pray. I've wanted to read my Bible, but I've messed up. And so I just kind of have this, you know, this idea that, well, do you know what, I need to, I better leave it a couple of days. And you get one, one day of, of clean living, one day of like not messing up too bad, and then I can pray again. Do you know what I mean? Whether it be, you know, because you've just bawled out one of the kids and you're fuming. I can't, I can't go to God in this sort of mood. I can't let him see me like this. I know it sounds stupid, but we all think like this from time to time. Or you've, you know you've messed up. You know you've gone to that website and you've looked at things you shouldn't have. I can't pray to God right now. I'm too filthy. I can't come to him like this. I'm ashamed. What's that about when we think that? It's just wrong, isn't it? How wrong is that? Maybe you're thinking, well, actually, I don't see what's wrong with that. I understand that. But let's flip it on its head and do it the other way around, and it becomes a bit clearer, I think. The flip side is when we feel really quite good about ourselves. 
Uh, we've done rather well. And, uh, well, I can come before God because I've, uh, I've done really well today. I'm, uh, I'm really good. I haven't sworn all day. And now I can praise God with these lips which are so holy. Yeah? Do you see the problems there? Do you see the problem with that thinking? Firstly, we're saying that God turns off his grace when we sin in a particular way. That he's that fickle and like he doesn't know about it anyway. That God is only for you when you're good and he's against you when you're bad. And do you know what that is? That's a heresy. That's against the gospel. If that were true, the gospel wouldn't be. When we believe the lie that we have to have this cooling off period between when we sin and when we come to God, well, we, believe, we begin to believe that we somehow have to earn some credit before we can come before him. And that is a denial of sola gratia. And it, when we do that, we deny the power of the gospel. The second problem is that those times when we get so proud and we think we've done so well because we've mastered one sin for one day, somehow we think that that covers over the 999,000 other ones we've done before breakfast. Well done, you. You may not have cursed with your lips, but you've cursed in your heart, you've hated, you've lusted. When we believe that we're acceptable to come before God because we've done this one thing, well, we've just added another sin to the pile, actually, in pride and self-righteousness, and we should give ourselves a little clap about that, shouldn't we? Your qualification to come before God in prayer, in worship, in study, to come to communion... It's not your behavior or works. Even the good ones, even the good works you do aren't your grounds for coming. The only thing that qualifies you to come before God is grace. Specifically, the righteous standing that is imputed to you, that is given to you through the death, the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ on your behalf which you do not deserve which you have not earned or caused to happen in any way that is your the, the basis for your standing before before God and for some of you it's hard to understand and and to believe that God could be like that because some of you have had parents or authority figures in your life who have not acted that way towards you some of you have had bad parents who did not well reflect the image of God. Who only loved you and showed you kindness when you pleased them. When you met their standards. But our Heavenly Father is not like that. He is all of love and of grace. And all you need to do to come before Him is to come as you are in the name of of Jesus and nothing can separate you from the love of God brothers and sisters to embrace the sweet life-giving truth of sola gratia is to know that you are loved by God even when you screw up even when you make a mess of things God doesn't stop loving you he doesn't stop spiritually providing for you. Earlier in Ephesians, if you read the whole book right at the beginning, we read that every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ. God doesn't remove them from us when we sin. They don't come and go. They don't fluctuate. They are bought and paid for by Christ. And they are safe and they are ours. God's love set upon you is not dependent on you. He loves you. Because he's chosen to love you and for no other reason and that is good news the second place i want to apply sola gratia is to evangelism for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing it is the gift of god not a result of work so that no one may boast three implications for evangelism from sola gratia the first one being it's free it's free let me ask you, why do, we, why do we feel weird telling people about Jesus? Why do we feel awkward about that? 
Because sometimes we do, don't we? We do. And I think sometimes it's because we feel like, oh, I'm having to go along now and I'm having to try and convince them of something. I feel awkward because it feels like I'm trying to get them to sign up to something maybe. But let me say, if we have this idea, we embrace all the gratitude, that all gets blown out the window because preaching the gospel shouldn't be like trying to get sponsorship from someone. You know, we, we do feel awkward a bit about that, don't we? We're not, but we're not trying to get anything from them when we preach the gospel because God doesn't want anything from them. Preaching the gospel should be the easiest, most joyful task in the world. We're just... We're just trying to give this awesome thing to people which is completely free. Just receive it. So we just, we, we get to give away grace. How wonderful is that? Think of it that way. What's embarrassing about giving away grace? Secondly, because sola gratia tells us that we had nothing to do with our own salvation, it changes how we evangelize. You see, if we believe we did something, if we believe we did anything in order to be saved, then we're going to feel like we have to convince other people to do something. We're going to feel as though we need to convince them. And A, firstly, that puts just incredibly unnecessary pressure on ourselves. We walk away and they go, oh, we go, oh, they, they didn't believe. Oh, maybe I... Maybe I didn't explain it right. Maybe I, I didn't convince them. But that's not your burden to bear. And secondly, we can at times give false hope when we declare somebody a Christian because they have been convinced to say a prayer, a set of words by us, rather than because they've been made regenerate by the Spirit. And so sola gratia just... It frees us up to offer the gospel, to preach the gospel without gimmick or, or burden. And actually, sola gratia forces the main power of our evangelism to come in prayer. Because we're going, Lord, you're doing it. I'm not doing it. Bring people, call people, and use me. That'd be wonderful. But Lord, it's all of you. Thirdly, so the gratia affects our evangel evangelism because it should affect how we love. If God can love and accept us even though we were and are unlovely and unacceptable, we read in Romans, for while we were still sinners, whilst we were still against God, Christ died for us. If that is true of us, then who are we to expect other people to change before we love them. If God has loved us when we were not just unacceptable, but completely against him, who are we to expect people to change before they come into this church? As people who have received and benefited from grace alone, shouldn't we be the most gracious people on earth? Unfortunately, we're not. And unfortunately, we push people away from this church with our judgmental attitudes and our unloving words towards those who do not meet our standards and it's wicked and it's wicked sola gratia means that we love people unconditionally The third and final place I want to apply sola gratia is to our assurance. Our assurance. Now, this is huge. I've said that a few times tonight. It's all pretty awesome. But this is really important to get. Everyone has times of doubt, I'm sure, right? Where you go, am I a Christian? Am I really saved? How can I know for sure? And when we ask those questions, there's three places that we're tempted to look to for assurance. And they are our faith, our works or our obedience, and our conversion. When we have those questions, those are the three place, places typically we want to look to for assurance. But let me tell you, none of those will give you peace. None of those will give you assurance. And let me tell you why. Your faith will never be enough to assure you we read here, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And yes, faith.
faith has an important role, and we'll be looking at that next week when we look at sola fide, faith alone. But faith is not the foundation of our salvation. And again, this is good news. Do you know why? Because your faith wavers. My faith wavers. It's up and down. Oh, you don't want a wobbly foundation, do you? You don't. Our faith wavers. We have doubts. And so if we look for assurance from our faith, if we think, if we look at how well I'm believing, how well I'm doing, well, that is going to change from moment to moment. And therefore our assurance is going to change from moment to moment. If we believe that receiving grace and salvation is based on our faith, then every single doubt we have, every single wobble of faith is going to psychologically send us to hell, isn't it? Wow, I'm obviously not saved because I'm doubting now this thing. Faith does not assure us. Neither does our obedience. We can be tempted to base our assurance on how well we tend to obey, how well we're doing. Uh, When we're doing well, we look at our walk, and yes, I am the epitome of a perfect Christian man. We feel assured. I've done well for about 10 minutes now. I feel good. I haven't done this sin for a week. I've, well, I've had my quiet time every day, apart from Wednesday. Um, I haven't sworn for, you know, on, on the way, on my commute to work with those, those drivers, you know. But let me ask you, in those times when you feel you've done kind of well for a little bit, what is it about that that makes you think your salvation game is so on point? You see, it sounds mad when we think about it. We get fooled into thinking that when we're obedient, it's somehow us that's caused it in the first place. That when I manage obedience, it's proof of my progress, of how well I have done. I'm doing good enough. My salvation is sure. Well, two things on that. Firstly, a little verse from Philippians. It says, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. I'm sorry to bust your bubble, folks, but... Even the good you do is only because God is at work in you. That's good news, really, but don't get on your high horse about it. But secondly, if you look to your obedience as the basis of your assurance, you are going to be crushed by it. Because every time you sin, and I would suggest that's at least daily, if not hourly, and I'm sure some of you are cursing me right now because this sermon's going on a little bit. Yeah? You're doing it right now. If you base your assurance on your obedience, it's going to crush you. Moral progress is not what should give you confidence before the face of God. Because I'm going to tell you now, you're going to find, you're always going to find a non-Christian who is more moral than you in certain areas or in certain ways. The third place we can be tempted to look to for assurance is the, instead of sola gratia is the circumstances of our conversion. And I know I keep kind of going back to this one, but it's really important. If we believe that grace only kicks in, as it were, when we decide to come to God of our own free will, if we believe that God only reaches out to us in grace once we have first come to him, then we're going to be constantly wondering whether we've done it right. As a child, I went through a phase where I would, the words I would use was give my life to Jesus. He doesn't need my life, I need his. Uh, but I would do that every single night. Because I wasn't sure if I'd said the prayer right the night before. Or if I'd meant it enough. Or if Jesus had heard me. Or if the sin I'd done the day before negated what I'd done. I was practically a Catholic. The good news of sola gratia is that we have no part to play in our salvation. And that is good news because, let me ask you, I'm sorry, but have you ever done anything right in your whole life? Have you ever done anything perfect? No. So just imagine how badly you'd screw up your salvation if you had anything to do with it. It's sola gratia, grace alone that saves us, and therefore it's the cross alone. That is our salvation, uh, that is our assurance, not our faith, not our works or our obedience, not the circumstances of our conversion. One of my lecturers at, uh, um, at college, Bob Lethem, he, he thought, it was very funny, he was being interviewed 
um, for a position um, at a, a church, a big church, uh, an important church. And he, they said to him, just tell us a bit about your testimony, Bob. And how were you saved? Well, I was saved by works. <gasps> the works of Christ. And that's the classic Bob right there. But it's true. It's the works of Christ that save us, not our own. It's only the cross, that fixed point in history, that truth that never changes, that truly happened. We look to that for our assurance. The cross was enough for you. One payment for all time, for all sins, for all who believe. We look at Jesus' track record, not our own. And if you believe that, the cross will daily, and it will be daily, you have to keep looking at it, will daily be the basis of your assurance. And if you keep doing that, you need never doubt your salvation. This is the glory of sola gratia. In Jesus, we see what it means to be saved by grace. We see a saviour who calls the dead from the tomb while they still reek of their sins. We see a saviour who promises to never leave us or forsake us even when we go astray. We look to a good shepherd who will lose none of his sheep. A good shepherd who declares all that the Father gives to me will come to me and I will lose none of them but raise them up on the last day. We look to a saviour who died for all our sins and who kept God's law perfectly every minute of his life so that his perfect righteousness could be given to you and to me to cover over our unrighteousness. We look to a saviour who was crucified, but who conquered death and the grave, who rose again and who ascended into heaven, and who is now ruling and reigning and all the while praying for us. He is our advocate and our defender. So the gratia is most clearly seen in the fact that Jesus Christ came to do for us the very thing that we could not do for ourselves. For he came to seek and to save that which was lost. This, friends, is sola gratia, the sinless Son of God dying upon a Roman cross for the sins of the world, rising from the dead for our justification and making us alive through his word, through Sola Scriptura, when we were still dead in our sins. Soli Deo Gloria. Glory to God alone. Amen.